2 Thessalonians 2, verse 10. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 10. It says that the man of sin will come, quote, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. We're going to focus this morning on the first part of that verse, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness. <coughs> Second Thessalonians 2, verses 9 and 10, tells us with what the man of sin will come. It specifies two things. He will come with mighty miracles. Verse 9. That was the last sermon in this series two weeks ago. He will come with mighty miracles, verse 9, and with deadly deception, that's verse 10, and our focus this morning. In this sermon, we want to consider together the following questions, amongst others. Does the Bible have much to say about the Antichrist's deceptive powers? That a big issue in Scripture. Is this mentioned in the Old Testament? Remember, we saw that the miracles of Antichrist did not occur as such in the Old Testament scriptures, but it was a development of the truth revealed in the New Testament. How is it that the man of sin will deceive? What are the means that he is going to use? What areas does he deceive? About what truths does he especially lie and seduce? And of course, the practical application of all of this is, how does all of this help us to watch and pray for Christ's second coming? Let's consider then the man of sin's deceptive powers. Number one, in various passages, and number two, as a warning to us, the man of sin's deceptive powers in various passages, and as a warning to us. The first passage that we should consider together, the first passages, are found in the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 8 reads, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots, and behold, in this horn, Antiochus Epiphanes, as a type of the Antichrist, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. <coughs> These great things that he speaks are proud things, proud lies about himself, which implies that he deceives others about his greatness. Verse 25 of this same chapter says that he shall speak great words against the Most High, that is, he shall tell lies about God, and he shall wear out, persecute, the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. Daniel chapter 8 says more about the Antichrist by way of type than does chapter 7. Daniel 8 verse 12 And an host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression and it, that is to say he, cast down the truth to the ground, and it, or he, practiced and prospered. He cast down the truth to the lie, the truth about God, the truth about how he is to be worshipped. So that truth was not known and confessed as before. Daniel 8 verse 23 emphasizes his intelligence. He is a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences. 
And this intelligence is displayed in verse 25. Through his policy, or cunning, he shall cause craft, or deceit, to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, lying about his own greatness to himself, and by peace and prosperity he shall destroy many, because he sucks them into a worldly kingdom simply of this present age. Finally, in Daniel, we turn to Daniel 11, which says more than chapter 7 and more than chapter 8 about the Antichrist's deceptions. <clears throat> Daniel 11, verse 21, the first verse on Antiochus Epiphanes and the man of sin in this chapter. In his estate, or place, shall stand up a vile person, <coughs> Antiochus, to whom they shall not give the honour of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries, by intrigue. Verse 23 says, After the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully. He's a deceiver. Verse 30 says, part way through, that he shall return and have intelligence or show regard for those that forsake the Holy Covenant. He sucks up to the apostates in Israel. Verse 32, such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. He shall tell lies, flattering people, and thereby corrupt and defile them. But the people, of, the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Verse 34b is similar. Many shall cleave to them with flatteries. <coughs> From Daniel, chapters 7, 8, and 11, on Antiochus Epiphanes IV, the greatest Old Testament type of the Antichrist, we see that the Old Testament does connect the Antichrist with deception very strongly and deliberately. The deception spoken of here is deception by means of words. Miracles aren't mentioned, just words. His words are lies about God, about himself, and lies against God's truth. And particularly, flatteries are mentioned. He flatters, he speaks lies in order to puff up those who depart from God's truth. Let's turn now to Matthew 24, Christ's Olivet Discourse, in the first book as arranged in our New Testament. Matthew 24, verses 4 and 5, the opening words of Christ's end times discourse. Take heed that no man deceive you. Remember, the man of sin in our text comes in with all deceivableness of unrighteousness. Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. The deception here is a claim to be Christ, which takes many in. Verses 9 through 12. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Verse 11. Deception through false prophets. Many are taken in. Iniquity abounds. Verse 12. The love of many waxes cold. So that, verse 10 says, many will be offended and stumble of the truth. They will betray each other. They will hate each other, professing Christians in the church. And, verse 9 says, that the people of God shall be hated of all nations for Christ's name's sake. 
which implies that the people of God will be slandered and lied about so that the world can justify <coughs> the hatred and persecution of God's people. Deception is also mentioned later in this chapter in verses 23 through 26. Lies about who Christ is. Lies about where Christ is. Then verse 23 says, If any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or lo, there, they're lying, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth, it's a lie. <coughs> Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. In this passage, Daniel, uh, Matthew 24, the deception here is especially in the church, in connection with the apostasy of the church. It comes through people, specific individuals labeled false prophets and false Christs, though the Antichrist personally is not specifically mentioned, but he's implied. This deception is very powerful, and many are deceived. And I hope you're building up a picture from these two passages, Daniel and Matthew, about the man of sin and his deceptive powers. <coughs> Moving now from the first New Testament book to the last New Testament book, beginning with Revelation 12, verse 9. Upon the ascension of Jesus Christ, we read, the great dragon was cast out of heaven. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. This devil then is working through the beast. Revelation 13, verse 14, referring to the second beast, says that he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the, the beast, the first beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast. And here, the deception is especially by means of his miracles. Finally, in Revelation, Revelation 19, verse 20, at the end of the age, the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. So the book of Revelation emphasizes deception by miracles, not so much by words. For it deals, the book of Revelation, with the beast's sway over the world, not so much <coughs> the false church. Also, Revelation, unlike 2 Thessalonians, for instance, brings in coercion, sword power, the persecution of the saints, even unto death, by the Antichrist and his worldwide kingdom. And now we turn to 1 John. 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2 has most in all the Bible to say about Antichrist's deception. That's why we chose 1 John 2 for the scripture reading earlier. Verse 18. 1 John 2 verse 18. Little children... It is the last time. And as we have heard that Antichrist shall come, one future Antichrist, even now are there many Antichrists, many present Antichrists, plural, whereby we know that it is the last time, because this is proof of it. And verse 22 connects Antichrist and antichrists with the deception 
lying about Jesus. Verse 22 says, who is a liar? That is, this is the biggest lie, and this makes a person the biggest liar. Who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist. Denieth <coughs> the Father and the Son. And regarding these people who lied about Jesus Christ, verse 19 says, They went out from us, us being the apostolic church. They went out from us, but they were not really and truly of us. Here's the proof. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. And immediately preceding the reference to the Antichrist and various Antichrists in verse 18, we have a warning against the world. That warning is contained in verses 15 through 17, three immediately preceding verses. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Why? If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Why is that? For all that are in the world, that is, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of the life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. The world passes away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. And after the call to love not the world, he continues into a very closely related subject, Antichrist. Because Antichrist and the world and worldly loves are intrinsically intertwined. In 1 John chapter 2, before the reference to the Antichrist and Antichrists in verse 18, and before the references to the world in verses 15 through 17, this chapter deals with many <coughs> exhortations to love the brethren. That's the number two. Verse eight. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him, Christ, and in you, because the darkness is past, and the true light now shineth. He that saith he is in the light, and hateth his brother, is in darkness, even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because the darkness hath blinded his eyes. Hating the brethren, in those verses, loving the world, and Antichrist, are all related to the mind of John. So verse 26 says, These things have I written to you about loving the brethren, about not loving the world, and about the Antichrist and Antichrists. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you, those who wish to deceive you. Turning over a page, 1 John chapter 4 returns to these same themes. The first three verses deal with false Prophets, verse 1, and the spirit of Antichrist, verse 3. The false prophets and the spirit of Antichrist lie about and against Jesus Christ, verse 3. And immediately after that comes the warning against worldliness. You're of God, little children. You've overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world. Therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. Powerful logic. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error or deception. And then comes the call to love the brethren. Immediately after the warning against worldliness, in verses 4 through 6, we read, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and every one that loveth is born of God, and knoweth of God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. Verse 11, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Verse 20, If a man say, I love God, 
and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. And you even have this exhortation to love the brethren immediately before the passage on Antichrist. That's the last two verses of 1 John 3. And this is his commandment. That we should believe in the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another as he gave his commandment. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him and he in him and hereby we know that he abideth in us by the spirit which he hath given us. So in 1 John chapter 2 and chapter 4 Antichrist's deception is especially connected with first of all False doctrine, particularly regarding Jesus Christ himself. Then, in the second remove, worldliness, and in the third remove, <coughs> hatred of the brethren, which leads to apostasy. And the Apostle John reiterates many of these points in the short second John. 2 John, verse 7. Many deceivers, word in our, in our text, many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver, second use of that word, and an antichrist because of false doctrine regarding Jesus. Verse 9 says, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. And again, this is connected with the love of the brethren in verses 4 through 6. That's what's meant by the commandment from the Father. And the new commandment, which is to love the brethren, as we saw in 1 John 2. Which brings us back to 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 10. The man of sin will come with all deceivableness of unrighteousness. He will come with deception about God, deception about himself, and deception about God's worship. As verse 4 says, He opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, including the true God, or that is worshipped, so that he, claiming to be God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. <laughs> this chapter teaches us that Antichrist's deception is through miracles, verse 9, and words, verse 10. Second Thessalonians 2 emphasizes that this is deception in the church, the visible church, which through this deception becomes apostate. 2 Thessalonians 2 is all of a piece with the other passages we've considered in Daniel, by the Antiochus Epiphanes IV as a type of Antichrist, Matthew 24, 1st and 2nd John, and Revelation. The Apostle Paul, by the Spirit, studied Daniel and wrote in connection with and in accordance with the teaching of the Apostle John and Christ himself in Matthew 24. And all of this, beloved, is designed as a warning to us, just as it was to the Thessalonians in the 2,000 years ago, <coughs> regarding what is coming. And here we want to draw together some of the themes and ideas in the various passages we have canvassed. This great deception through the Antichrist will occur in the spheres of both the church and the state. Great deception in the false church. 2 Thessalonians 2 and Matthew 24 emphasize the church. Daniel 
and revelation emphasize the lies and deception in the state. And when the state becomes consumed with lies and persecutes the church, the state becomes a beast, a fierce, ravaging animal to tear and destroy the church of God. And that's the way Daniel and Revelation describe an ungodly, persecuting state. And not only will this deception come through the false church and an intrusive, persecuting, powerful state, but that this state and this religion will be one worldwide kingdom and one worldwide false church in every country. So that wherever you are on the earth, state mandated idolatry will be required of each and every citizen. That's particularly the emphasis of the book of Revelation. In the passages we have considered, there are various persons, flesh and blood people, who will promote the great deception. Even now we have false teachers, false prophets, false apostles, false Christs, anti-Christian tyrants in the state, and it will culminate in the man of sin and the false prophet. Various means of deception will be used by these <coughs> powerful people in the worldwide church and state. Two means are especially emphasized, miracles, Matthew 24, 2 Thessalonians 2, <coughs> Revelation, and lying words and false claims, 2 Thessalonians 2, Daniel, Revelation, 1st and 2nd John. And along with these powerful people in church and state in this worldwide kingdom, kingdom using various means of deception, there are other coercing pressures. If you do not conform, you will be persecuted even to the death penalty. You will be hated by the world cordially. And it is a wretched thing to feel yourself hated. And Economic constraints will be placed on you because you will not be able to buy or sell without the mark of the beast. Meanwhile, left, right and centre, so to speak, other professing Christians all around you will be apostatizing and betraying one another, grassing to the state, telling on you so that you too will be arrested and killed but for God's gracious providential intervention and the hatred in the world through natural depravity of man will be at its most intent, intense, possibly, even probably, in the church which apostatizes because there will be hatred of one another, which hatred of course is most evident when those who apostatize <coughs> grasp and tell upon to the true Christians so as to buy some leeway with the state for themselves by selling out their erstwhile brethren. And this is brought out in various ways in our own text. A couple of weeks ago I mentioned the various false leaders <coughs> made the point that if these false leaders can do miracles, when the man of sin comes, he will do greater miracles, because he's higher up the greasy pole, so to speak. Well, it's the same thing with deceptive powers. It takes a certain deceptive power to make a person a false teacher. A false prophet is more deceptive. A false apostle is higher up. A false Christ can deceive more powerfully, but the most deceptive is the great false Christ, the Antichrist, the man of sin. And he will bring, more than any other human being, the deceptive powers of miracles and the abuse of the tongue with regard to the ninth commandment to its highest ever level. 
And so verse 10 says, he will come, quote, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness. He doesn't just come with some deceivableness or a lot of deceiv deceivableness, but with all deceivableness. And it doesn't just say he will lie. Because somebody can lie and not be at all convincing. But he will come with all deceivableness. He will persuade. And he will come with all deceivableness because Satan himself stands behind the man of sin's deception. Verse 9 says that the wicked one's coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness. And Satan knows a thing or two about deception. <coughs> he is a liar from the beginning who abode not in the truth. He has been lying for 6,000 years, the history of sin begins with his lie to Eve when he deceived her, and then Adam fell. Satan is such a liar that he even lies to himself. He even meditates and delights in the lies which he utters to himself. This is Isaiah 14, the words of Satan to himself, in his own heart, quote, For thou hast said in mine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the most high which is nothing but a tissue of lies. He won't, and he can't, but he lies to himself. Satan is such a liar that he even lied to God's face. We read about that in the first couple of chapters of Job. He lied to God about Job. He says, Lord, you have hedged Job about you, made life so comfortable for him, but let me have a go at him. And if I afflict him, he will curse you to your face. And God says, okay, by his permission and powerful binding problems, have at him. And then he did so, and Job blessed God. But not confounded, Satan kept up his lie and came back to God the second time and says, ah, but if I get him in this area, he will curse thee to thy face. He lied in the face of God. And this too fits with Scripture's teaching about Satan and indeed his emissaries. This is 2 Corinthians 11. Paul here is talking about the false apostles who opposed his work in Corinth. Such are false apostles, deceitful workers. The word deceitful is always being used transforming themselves, these false apostles, into the apostles of Christ. The false apostles change, transform themselves by deceit as if they were the apostles of Christ. And if someone thinks, well, how in the white world could they do that? The next verse says, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. And just think of the claims of the charismatics and of some of these new agers an angel from heaven came and told me. Satan transformed himself into an angel of light and they were deceived. Therefore, it is no great thing. You ought not think this to be marvelous or strange or hard to believe. It's no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. No great thing. What happens all the time? Every day, some of the most praised and lauded churchmen in this world, the ones who make millions and sell books by the thousands and the hundreds of thousands, <clears throat> transformed into the apostles of Christ. As 
lifted or ministers in righteousness. And if you think of the Tower of Satan working deceit so that false apostles in the first century, when there were true apostles teaching and ministering and preaching who had established that church, including the church of Corinth, imagine the deception of Satan in the man of sin himself. He will be changed into not just an angel of light, but the greatest, the most holy and the most wonderful or the most loving and gracious and wonderful person that's ever been. In the face of all this deception and all these <coughs> lies, worldwide lies, by the highest ranking people with all the power of modern propaganda beaten into everybody's home, the question has to be asked, how are we and our children going to stand? And the answer is, it's always the answer, by the grace of God alone. Grace of God found in Jesus Christ, the true Christ, alone. Which grace is, as it has to be in order to save us, and as it has to be in order to keep us from this great deception, irresistible grace. Arminian grace wouldn't keep anybody from the Antichrist, but irresistible grace can and will. The cross of Jesus Christ, that atonement which he made 2,000 years ago, will keep every last child of God from the worldwide deception of the man of sin. But it won't be easy. It will involve struggle and loss and persecution and tears and prayers and hardship. The cross saves us, but the cross brings the cross. The hardship for the people of God. And we will be kept through the love of the truth, <coughs> because it's only the love of the truth of God's word which will keep us from the lie of the Antichrist and his deception. We've been saying from 2 Thessalonians 2 that there are certain things which must happen first before the man of sin will come. The great apostasy. We're not there yet. So the question then is, how are we doing today? Are we standing now? I'm reminded of these words from Jeremiah, chapter 12, verse 5. If thou hast run with the footmen, and they have wearied thee, then how canst thou contend with horses? You could tire out running with the footmen when it's not too bad. How would you cope if you have to run with horses? The second argument, if in the land of peace wherein thou trustest they weary thee, then how wilt thou do in the swelling of Jordan? If you can't cope when things are relatively peaceful, whenever the Jordan swells, where will you be? And of course, the difficulties here are the difficulties of Jeremiah when he's being persecuted by the false prophets, because the next verse is on to say, even my brethren, and the house of thy father, even they have dealt treacherously with thee. Yea, they have called a multitude after thee. Believe them not, though they speak fair words unto thee. And so first and second John especially deal with this. The Antichrist is coming, but even now there are many Antichrists. And the question therefore is, do you love the truth? Right now, biblical reformed truth. Centering on Jesus Christ himself. You must love the truth. Now, do you love the brethren? You must. Do you love the world? You must not. Otherwise, you're a prime candidate for the falling away. And if we just think who the man of, Christ, the man of sin is, he's the man of Sin. He works through sin. He works through sin and our sinful lusts and deeds. And he works through sin as it governs this sinful world. Which sinful world is hankering for his coming. It wants a man like this. 
and which sinful world, which sees its own sin embodied in him and loves him for it, will gladly receive him and worship him. We've got what we want and we've never had it so good. And this one who is the son of perdition won't say, I came from hell. All those who follow me will perish everlastingly. And he will present his kingdom as heaven on earth. And they will love it. A kingdom of sin and worldliness as heaven on earth. And they'll believe it. And are you open to flattery? I found this intriguing in researching this sermon. That the first text which deals with the man of sin, this great type of one, time is a thing that keeps emphasizing flattery. The greatest Old Testament type of Antichrist, flattery. And in the New Testament, flattery gets quite a lot of scope. Flattery is especially connected in the New Testament with false teachers. Those who come to foolish folk with itching ears and scratch them by telling them exactly what they want to hear. And here are some flattering words that people love to hear. You have free will. You're basically good. Whether you're saved or not depends on you. And you know all this talk about sin, especially the Reformed Church, depressing. You don't need to hear that. That only brings you down. What you need to hear is how good you are. You need to come to church for a pep talk. The minister needs to tell you that you're an awful lot better than what you think. And that you can do it all. The power of positive thinking. The world isn't that bad. You don't have to watch out for the world. You need to be friendly with the world. It's a lot of good in the world. Cooperate with it. Make it better. And you have it in you. You can do it always. And you don't need to listen to the admonitions of the church or the scriptures. Because it's all too sharp. You need to come to us. Because our church is an awful lot nicer than them. And our smiles are a lot nicer than them. And we spend more time on cosmetics and makeup than our minister. And he just looks lovely up there and he can, he can hug you and just love you to death. That's why Joel Austin is so popular. <coughs> and our church won't tell you the sharp edges of the word of God. You'll be okay. <coughs> and our company and our world is filled with false teachers and false churches like this. And Jeremiah says, my people love to have it so. Second Timothy 4 says they heap to themselves false teachers. You can't get enough of them. All deceivableness of unrighteousness. Of unrighteousness. And unrighteousness deals with the standard. There's a right standard. There's a right standard in doctrine and ethics, in faith and life, and there's unrighteousness here. All deceivableness of unrighteousness, all deceivableness as to regards what you believe, and as regards how you live. All deceivableness of unrighteousness. The lie is so deceiving that it just looks exactly like the truth. The lie is so persuasive that ungodliness looks like the height of piety. The lie is so deceptive that the world looks like the kingdom of God. And Antichrist looks a whole lot better than Jesus Christ ever did. And so the issue with the man of sin and his deceptiveness is discernment. If you can tell the difference between truth and a lie and between righteousness and unrighteousness. Discernment. <coughs> and the issue of discernment is largely this what do you want? Because many people, most people, want to be deceived. They want to be deceived. They want to have a world and be told that they go to heaven. They want to be told, it doesn't really matter what you believe, you can dabble in false doctrine, and we'll get you there in the end. They want it because their hearts are set on evil. 
Because man not only is in darkness, but man loves darkness because his deeds are evil and will not come to the light lest his deeds should be reproved. And it's only grace that can save us from ourselves. All deceivableness of unrighteousness. It is possible, for instance, for someone to be deceived and it not even be a sin on the part of the one deceived. You could be deceived, for instance, in thinking all the cars in New Zealand are black. Well, Henry Ford said, you know, with Model T Ford, that every car is black. Maybe the New Zealanders. Maybe the New Zealanders listened to that and said, you know, we've got to be black cars. <coughs> and beside all that, the rugby team's called the All Blacks, so maybe they all drive black cars. And besides all that, who here has been in New Zealand you haven't seen? If you believe an admittedly silly lie like that, you wouldn't be sinning. You'd be a bit naive, but it wouldn't be a great sin. But Antichrist comes with all deceivableness of unrighteousness, so that it is a sin not only in him to deceive, but it is a sin on behalf of, or on the part of, those who listen to his deception, because it's an intensely ethical and religious lie which is being taught. And so the issue with the Antichrist, in connection with all deceivableness of unrighteousness, is the ninth commandment. The ninth commandment. Here's Lord's Day 43. What is required in the ninth commandment? That I bear false witness against no man, never mind against God, nor falsify any man's words, that I be no backbiter nor slanderer, that I do not judge nor join in condemning any man rashly or unheard, but that I avoid all sorts of lies and deceit as the proper works of the devil who works through Antichrist and Antichrists unless I would bring down upon me the heavy wrath of God. Likewise, that in judgment and in all other dealings, I love the truth, speak it uprightly and confess it. Also that I defend and promote, as much as I am able, the honour and good character of my neighbour. And it's especially, and this is the power of the Ninth Commandment, those who break the Ninth Commandment, who are living in lies, that those who are most open to being deceived further. They love and live lies, and when he comes, they'll say, ah, one of my own. He and I will have that. Lord's Day 43 says that we must love the truth and speaketh uprightly and confess it. We must follow him who is the way, the truth, and the life, not him whose coming is with all deceivableness of unrighteousness. And we must worship and serve alone the true and living God. Because, as verse 8 reminds us, one day the truth incarnate will return. The true word of God will breathe the spirit of truth. And the unrighteous, deceiving man of sin will be consumed.